Ms. Waxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for appearing today and for everything that you do to keep, to keep our community safe. Um, and I want to thank you also for acknowledging the officers who died as a result of the events of January 6th uh, in, your, in your written testimony and in your testimony here today. Um, Chief Pittman, I just want to be absolutely clear for the record. Do you acknowledge that the, uh, that the uh, off death of Officer Brian Sicknick was a line of duty death? Yes, ma'am, I do. Do you acknowledge that Officer Howie Liebengood's death was a line of duty death? Uh, I can't speak to that at this time, ma'am. So you're, you're not going to acknowledge that, that it was a result, result of the events on January 6th that Howie Liebengood is no longer with us? I cannot speak to that uh, at this time. Why can't you speak to it at this time? Because it's still under active investigation. Well, do you acknowledge, I know that he's not your officer, but would you acknowledge that the officer Jeffrey Smith, his MPD, that his death was a line of duty death? I'm sorry, Officer Jeffrey Smith is not a U.S. Capitol Police officer. So you're not going to acknowledge that his death was a line of duty death either? I'm sorry, ma'am, he is not our officer, U.S. Capitol Police. So I'm kind of concerned, and I know that the ranking member brought up that that you know that 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 there was a vote of no confidence for you in in, in the union, and uh, and I'm kind of concerned because you're not standing by your officers. I think it's very clear that Officer Liebengood would still be with us today, but for the events of January 6th, and and the fact that you're not willing to stand by him today is very concerning to me. Now the Capitol Police does offer death gratuities for survivors of all officers. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. As I stated before, I've been on this organization for over 20 years now. I do stand with my officers, and there's a large number of officers uh, that have expressed that they stand with the question, me. Captain, the, 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 uh, the chief, chief, the question was, yes, does the Capitol Police offer death gratuities for survivors of all officers for any reason that they may have passed away? Yes, ma'am, we do. And did, can you confirm whether this has been at least been processed for the family of Officer Liebengood? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Has that death gratuity been processed for the family of Officer Liebengood such that his survivors will receive that payment? Yes, ma'am, it has. Okay, thank you. Now, I want to talk a little, bit, a little bit more about the logistics and the number of, of officers that were on duty on January 6th and, and what you did to prepare. Now, on an average Sunday when Congress is not in session, what would the staffing levels be at the Capitol grounds with Capitol Police? About how many would be on duty? So on an average day, uh, our manpower is driven by whether uh, Congress is in session or out. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Capitol Police leaned forward with an aggressive, aggressive ready reserve posture so we so I'm sorry, the question is what would the, what would the number of officers be on an average, let's say an average Sunday and the Congress is not in session? Yes, yeah, so I would say less than 700. And how about on an average Wednesday when Congress is in session? So those numbers upward uh, past 1,000. So that's just an average Wednesday. And it depends Wednesday on a, when... a lot of, I'm sorry, it depends on a lot of factors, but that's kind of average. So over a thousand. Yes. Okay. And how many would be on duty for some sort of special dignitary event like a State of the Union? How many how many officers would you have on duty for that? That would pretty much be our full complement, with the exception uh, we would adjust shifts even for our midnight's officers. They would come in early. So it's not as cut and dry uh, as we have X number of people. It just depends on the timing of the event. But that's typically a full hands on deck, if you will, for lack of a and, better term. And can you give us some sort of ballpark number of about what, what all hands on deck would entail in terms of numbers? U.S. Capitol Police's full strength right now is 18, over 1,800 officers. But okay. with that said, there's a 
complement of officers that would come and relieve those who had worked, let's just say, a 16-hour shift because we're 24 seven operation. And how many did you have planned to have on duty prior to the January 3rd assessment? So, so prior to getting that assessment and making the adjustments that you, that you outlined in your testimony, how many do you plan to have on duty? So the adjustments were made primarily to our civil disturbance units. A civil disturbance unit is comprised of, of what we- I'm just, I'm just asking you for numbers, Chief Pittman. I'm just asking you for numbers, so. So yes, how I'm many just, did you plan uh, to have on duty? Given it context, we went from approximately four platoons to seven. Okay, and what is Platoon what are those is numbers? Platoon forty officers. I'm sorry. We went up to two hundred and seventy six officers for CD civil disturbance units. Okay, but the other officers stayed the same. No, ma'am. We also. We were prepared for a 24 hour uh, session, if you will, based on the number of challenges that would be allowed to, as it relates to the electoral votes being counted. We knew that there were a number of hours that each state could contest those uh, electoral votes. So we prepared for going over 24 hours with our officers. So our officers were st strategically uh, positioned so that we would have coverage from zero uh, 800 hours on the 6th all the way through uh, January 7th. So over a 24 hour period. So between a thousand officers on an average day and 1800 officers on a, on a State of the Union type day, how many officers were you expecting to have present for January so 6th? We had 1,200 officers at approximately 12 p.m. on that day. And okay. then by 1,600 hours, we had 1,400 officers uh, on the campus on January 6th. With even full even, but even before, even before you got that intelligence, you knew that you were going to have the first, second, and third uh, officials in line for the presidency all in the same place at the same time, correct? Yes. Okay. So you would think that you would make it more of a more of a security, um, more more along the lines of a state of the union than than you know an average day. And it sounds like even with the threat assessment, it was kind of still treated like an average day. No, ma'am. No, there was some. There was some. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, my time okay. is. I, I, I don't okay. want to waste my time. Um, the uh, the there's been some talk about this January third special assessment from your office, which went out on that Sunday. Is that correct? Sunday, January third. Right. I'm sorry, as that, far as that January special, 3rd? That special assessment from January 3rd, that came out on a Sunday and was disseminated to, to staff within the uh, Capitol Police, right? That was widely distributed within the department, yes ma'am. Okay, now in your written testimony, you said it was emailed to all officers above the rank of sergeant. Yes. Does that mean, does that mean sergeant and above or lieutenants and above? Above the lieutenants and above. So isn't it the sergeant? Isn't it the sergeant who handle the roll call and do the most have the most contact with the day to day officers on the street on the street? Yes, ma'am, Miss Wexon, I apologize. That's sergeant and above. Okay, so it did include sergeant. Yes, ma'am. Good. Good. And then there was some discussion from Representative Clark and Representative Newhouse about these daily intelligence reports that came out in the days following. Is that right? You acknowledge that those exist, right? Yes. And that they were disseminated to the sergeant at arms, the architect of the Capitol, the various folks within the uh, within the Capitol Police as well. Yes, that is correct. And you acknowledge that the threat assessments in those were down to remote, highly improbable, or improbable. Is that right? That's a separate assessment from that. Uh, report that was issued on January 3rd, but that is correct. Right, but they were subsequent reports that went out and were disseminated by, by the Capitol Police. Is that right? Yes, yes that okay. is correct. And you are going to, um, and you're gonna provide those to this committee, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, ma'am, I will. Okay. Very good. Um, I wanna follow up very briefly on a question from the ranking member about the, uh, about the command. Uh, and the communications. Uh, who made the call for the commanders to leave the incident command center and assist officers under assault? 
Is that, is, there, is that a protocol? Is that a fail safe? I mean, what do you do when that happens? To leave the command center? We, you were talking about the communication center and that's why the, the, the officers on the ground were left to fend for themselves when it came to communication. Well, no, it's uh, referred to as the incident command system, not the command center itself. Okay, the incident command it, system. Yes. Who made the decision for, for, that, for that center to be abandoned? That incident no, command system to be abandoned? No, no it's not a, a physical uh, place. It's a policy and procedure that we have that we uh, train to at, for critical incidents, if you will. Okay, so that you will have one line of communication coming from the top down to all the officers on the ground? Is that what the purpose of it is? It doesn't uh, align one communication down from the top. It's a structured system. It's tiered. Um, the person with boots on the ground has certain responsibilities, and then it defines each of those persons in the incident command structure, what their role and responsibility is. So is it safe to say that that structure failed on January 6th? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now, United States Capitol Police is notoriously opaque. You guys have had zero public press, press conferences in your department in the nearly two months since the attack. Now, having this kind of a news vacuum creates a, 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 a community where conspiracy theories and, theories and misinformation can spread easily. That's obviously something that's very concerning to all of us. Um, why haven't you had any public press briefings? Yes, ma'am. So U.S. Capitol Police has issued a number of press releases. But with that said, we felt like the primary responsibility after an attack like January 6th was really to focus on our employees, their health and well-being, as well as providing the necessary information uh, to our oversight committee. So we have uh, streamlined those communications, set up regular calls uh, with oversight and core leadership. So we make sure that we um, communicate it's, with them it's, it's on a regular basis. It's been almost two months. It's been almost two months. Will you commit to having public press briefings in the future from this point going forward? No, ma'am, not at this time. Okay, and if you, if you, I know that you're acting chief right now, if you become the, the, the full on chief and you're confirmed as chief, um, would you confer, would you, would you agree to have them at that point or are you just, it's just not something that you're interested in doing ever? My priorities would still be my employees first and foremost, and I know that I am to respond appropriately and timely to the oversight committees that govern not only the U.S. Capitol Police, but the Capitol Police Board. All right, so you'll answer our questions, but not those of the press. Is that what I'm getting from you? No, ma'am, I'm not saying that I would not answer questions of the press, but leaning forward as we go forward, my priority still would remain with the workforce and to the uh, committees that provide oversight as well as our appropriators. Okay. Thank you. And I just have one final question. As a member who, who represents a, a, a chunk of the national capital metro region, um, you know, looking at all these fences and having these fences around what, what really is a beautiful public park um, on any other day is, is disturbing and, uh, and, and not, not sustainable in my mind. Um, Chief Pittman and Mr. Blodgett, because I don't want you to feel left out, Mr. Blodgett, can you reassure us that the fencing around the Capitol is, is, is not permanent? Mr. Blodgett, we'll start with you. In my mind, it's not permanent, no. Okay, thank you. How about you, Chief Pittman? No, the temporary infrastructure is only to address the vulnerabilities after the attack of January 6th. Our priority is to make sure that the members of Congress are safe and that democratic process is protected. Once we have appropriate infrastructure and human assets in place, we will lean forward with the removal of the fencing. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I'm confident that my time has expired. I didn't see the timer going off, but uh, thank you so much for your indulgence and I'll yield back. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate it. Uh, great questions. And let me just say, uh, uh, Chief, I think you know we can do both. We appreciate your 
um, communications with us, and that has improved dramatically. But we also think the American people and the press need to hear directly from you. So I would just encourage you to take some time, uh, you know, in making sure that that the residents of Capitol Hill, Washington D.C., the people around the country, after having watched what happened, um, would benefit from hearing from you directly.